for those who do not know me, I am the very Reverend Kim L. Coleman, President of the National Union of Black Episcopalians. And I welcome you on behalf of UBE to this afternoon's presentation of Talk to Talk, Empowering Local Action to Impact Episcopal Church Policy. Please allow me to share a few of the logistical norms that will govern our time together. Unless you are one of the panelists, we ask all attendees to please put your device on mute. That'll help us minimize background sound. As our presentation unfolds, please add your questions and comments to the chat box. We have allotted time at the end of the program to entertain those questions and comments. As you may already have noted, this session is being recorded and will be available later on the UBE website at ube.org. The best way to receive notice that the recording has been uploaded to YouTube is to sign up to follow UBE's YouTube channel and do that today. Assisting us this afternoon with technology is Mother Lynn Collins and uh, Robbie, Robbie Gunderson. Uh, they are part of her team. Um, and if you have any questions with technology, uh, please reach out to Mother Collins um, through chat box with a private note or to Robbie. Our program today features as guest panelists, the Reverend Dr. Quasi A. Thornell, the Reverend Karen David Lawson, and the Honorable Byron Rushing. Each possesses an impressive track record in pursuing and achieving racial justice and equality, particularly within this church that we all love so dearly. You will hear more about our presenters as our program gets underway. Serving as moderator is Mr. Joe McDaniel Jr a proven advocate for racial justice and equality in his own rights. Joe is a deputy to the upcoming general convention, logistical coordinator for the black deputies and UBE's representative to the consultation. He serves as co-chair of the Diocese of Central Gulf Coast Commission on Racial Justice and Reconciliation and is secretary treasurer of the Reverend Dr. Robert E. DeBose Jr. chapter of UBE. This past July, Joe was awarded the President's Award for exemplary service and dedication shown to UBE and those whom we serve. Following our opening prayer, the next voice you hear will be that of moderator Joe McDaniel Jr. Let us pray. Almighty God, in whom we have our being now and at our end, grant to us, we beseech you, the wisdom to keep you ever before and beside us in all that we attempt to do. Help us to remember and keep before us the faith of our fathers and mothers who have gone before us in the struggle for freedom, equality, and justice. Grant that we will never become so complacent and self-satisfied with what we think we have accomplished or become drunk with the wine of the world that we become the instruments of our own destruction. May there be peace among us as we put on the armor of God and move forward, sacrificing if necessary for the sake of your will and your vision, that we all may be one. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you, Mother Kim, for that very gracious introduction. It is good to be here with you today as we focus on the weighty topics of influencing the agenda of General Convention by introducing resolutions on the Dyson level and the importance of why we as people of color should be concerned about influencing these agendas. First, to set the stage, let me state that the General Convention is the governing body of the Episcopal Church that meets every three years. 
It is a bicameral legislature that includes the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops, composed of deputies and bishops from each diocese. During its triennial, triennial meeting, deputies and bishops consider a wide range of important matters facing the church. The principal way General Convention conducts its legislative work is through perfecting, debating, and adopting resolutions. Only certain interim bodies, bishops, provinces, dioceses, and deputies may submit resolutions for consideration. In the legislative context, a resolution is a statement that requires specific action so that if both houses adopt it, the General, the general Convention or an, or an identified person, group, or agency of the church will act accordingly. Now, as Mother Kim has stated, we have a very distinguished panel that will educate us on how you, as members of the Union of Black Episcopalians, whether lay or clergy, can get resolutions introduced at the local diocesan level and then have these resolutions filtered up to general convention. How these resolutions can shape churchwide policy, policies and the implications for shaping the everyday lives of people of color that these policies can play. Again, as we progress through today's program, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will get to as many of them as our time allows. On our panel today, we have the Reverend Kevin Davis Lawson, who serves as the rector of St. George's Episcopal Church Astoria, and she is the first black and female rector in the church's 194 year history. She is a graduate of Brooklyn College of the City University of New York and earned her Master's of Divinity from the General Theological Seminary. In the Diocese of Long Island, the Reverend Davis Lawson has served as Secretary of Convention since 2013. As part of her responsibilities, she is a point of contact for the clergy and laity of the diocese regarding eligibility to serve on diocesan committees and commissions, canonical regulations, and deadlines. Reverend Karen, Reverend Karen is a three-time deputy to General Convention, a former president of the Diocesan Black Clergy Caucus, a lifetime member of UBE, and a charter member of the newly instituted Dyson UBE chapter. Next, we have the, Rep, the Reverend Canon Dr. Quasi Thornell, who was one of the most respected and experienced leaders of our church. He presently serves as a member of the Bishop of the Diocese of, the, of Southeast Florida staff as the Bishop's de Deputy for Special Ministries, where he oversees anti-racism and racial justice ministries. Having trained at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he was ordained a deacon in 1972 and a priest in 1973. Over a lengthy and multifaceted ministry, he has served as a parish priest, a cathedral canon, a diocesan staff member, and a seminarian professor. He was instrumental in the founding of the Bishop John Walker School for Boys in Washington, D.C. in 2007, and he was vice president from 1984 to 1988, and then president from 1998 to 1990 of the National Union of Black Episcopalians. He served on the executive council of the Episcopal Church from 2000 to 2006. And lastly, but certainly not the most least of all, we have the Honorable Byron Rushing, who, who as a state representative from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, was an original sponsor of the Gay Rights Bill and the chief sponsor of the law to end discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in public schools. He was a spokesman against the, rest, against the restoration of the death penalty in Massachusetts and for a moratorium on executions in the nation. He led the Commonwealth's anti-apartheid efforts, and he was the chief sponsor of the health reform law, ending pre-existing condition refusals by insurance companies, and has a laundry list of social justice advocacy work too lengthy to mention here. After all, we only have an hour for the program. Byron has been a deputy to every general convention since 1973, and presently serves as the vice president of the House of Deputies. So let's jump into our first question. 
Our first question for each of the panelists, why should I as a mere layman or laywoman care about what happens at both my local Dyson convention and the general convention? More specifically, what Christian doctrine dictates that I be concerned about the policies that emanate from the local Dyson level and the general convention? Who would like to go first? Well, I'll go first. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go to the second part so we can start at the beginning of time, right? And uh, the, 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 the biblical theological basis uh, for this is, of course, the concept a uh, Pauline concept of the body of Christ. And we are all members of the body of Christ. And so that's in the Bible. <laughs> and now how does that get interpreted 2000 years later? And in the Episcopal Church, uh, when, the, when the Episcopal Church began, when the, when the American Revolution uh, had, uh, had be, uh, successfully been <coughs> carried out and they had to figure out how they were going to be uh, an independent part of the Anglican communion in the, in the new, brand new United States of America, that informed them. That also, it also, the fact that, that the idea of democracy um, was one of the ideas that it was put forward during that time by white people. And so when the Episcopal Church was first organized, it was organized to be democratic. It was organized so that lay people clergy and eventually bishops would all be a part of a, a process by which they all could be heard and representatives of those groups uh, could make decisions. And that was where uh, general convention, the concept of general convention and the actual gen general convention came from. Um, and so they did some radical things um, unlike the Church of England, they let all of those groups uh, be involved in the election of bishops. And, uh, and then they went on to make sure that there would be no one person who would run the church. So, there was, so we had no one that had the power of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and we had, certainly had no one that with the power of the Pope and the, and that, and the, and the, lead, and the head of our church is a group of people called the General Convention. There is no temporal authority in the Episcopal Church higher than the General Convention. So for me, the theological basis actually is based in our baptismal covenant. As the baptized, we are called to seek and serve Christ in all persons and to strive for justice, freedom, and peace among all people, respecting their dignity. Um, in addition, our catechism says that the laity are to take their place in the life, work, and worship, and the governance of the church, as well as the clergy. So by just being Christians and baptized Episcopalians, we are called to be involved in the governance of our church. And I like to go back to the prophet Isaiah, who says in chapter 29, but seek first the welfare of the city where you have sent, you've been sent into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in, its, in seeking its welfare, you will find your welfare. So we're called to get off the bench. And I would add to both of those that the uh, general convention, the diocese convention, is only one aspect of our call to involvement. We need to use, as, especially as Black people, use every institution that we're related to to make sure the society responds justly to the issues that we are faced with. So we use the church because we know it's a powerful instrument. We also use the church because historically, as Byron points out, many of the powerful people who have governed our country over years have come from within the Episcopal Church. You know, they have been the movers and shakers and political leaders. And so we are called to be, by Matthew 25, to feed the hungry, visit the poor, visit those in jail. We're called to be engaged in life. So there's no separation 
in terms of what we did. Jesus, when he was crucified, that was a political act. You know, that was a political act. It was not just a religious act. It was a political act. We are called to be engaged to influence and impact our lives. And as has been pointed out, to respect the dignity of every individual. But be clear, the General Convention, the Diocese Convention, is only one institution that we need to be engaged in. We want the church to impact the political institutions where decisions are actually made. Very good, very good. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent, those excellent uh, answers. Our next question is for each of the panelists and it reads as follows. <clears throat> what can I do to impact the agenda and shape the policy decisions that emanate from the local Dyson Convention and the General Convention? In other words, is there anything I can do on the local level to get a resolution approved there and passed down to General Convention? And how do I go about doing that? What are the procedures that I must follow to make that happen? Okay, so I'd like to jump in on that one. Um, the first thing I'd say is to talk to people about the issues that are near and dear to your heart. Um, get people to join with you, to buy in, get support, and work with them to write a resolution that can be presented to your diocesan convention. Now, the form of the resolution may vary by diocese, so I would suggest that you contact the secretary of convention or the coordinator of convention, whoever it is in your diocese who is the contact person for convention. You should contact them, find out the correct format um, for resolutions in your diocese, and the write the resolution, make sure, have them check it to make sure it's in the correct format. And it needs to be endorsed by a delegate to convention, um, submitted by a delegate and um, seconded by a delegate. There are deadlines for submitting um, resolutions in your diocese. Find out what the deadline is and make sure that you get the resolution uh, submitted by that time in the correct format. So there's quite a bit of work to be done even before you get to convention. Um, be prepared to speak to the resolution. Why is this important? Why should other people, um, why should delegates vote to approve that resolution? Um, and if the, um, once the resolution comes to the floor of convention, be prepared to speak to it, have other delegates who would be willing to speak to that resolution. Um, in the resolution, you can ask that it be, if it's approved, that it's forwarded to your provincial synod or to general convention um, as a resolution there. And that should be part of the resolution as well. If it's approved, then the Secretary of Convention will forward that resolution to the appropriate body as listed on the resolution. In the Diocese of Long Island, we have pre-convention meetings where these resolutions are brought forward and discussed even before they get to the floor of convention. So it's very important that you know what the process is in your diocese. Um, usually it it's in the canons, the rules of order. Quite often that's on the diocesan website. If you can't figure it out, find somebody who can point you in the right direction. And at the local level, that's how the resolutions work. Very good. Byron, would you like to add to that? Well, I would just, first, let me just say broadly that, that uh, it's really important uh, that we all have the experience of uh, participating in as many of the areas uh, of governance that, 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 we are, that we can and are allowed to. Um, we, we don't have a lot of direct democracy uh, in, in the Episcopal Church. Almost all of our democracy is representative, but... That, but, but we really need to make sure 
that we start at the local level. We should be participating in the decisions that our congregation, our parish makes. We should, we should make sure we always go to annual meetings and we should be thinking if we, if we want to influence our own parish about running for vestries. And so all of those, I, I want to begin at that local level. And then as Karen has told us about uh, the, the diocesan convention level, um, again, uh, that is a place uh, that even if we do not get elected as a delegate from our own parish, that we participate, that we find out what's going on, that we get interested in it, we go to it. We can go, we go and visit that, make sure that we, we go to visit those uh, diocesan conventions and see um, now, not, not unfortunately on Zoom still, um, but, as, but soon in person, how, how they operate and what happens there. So we, have, we are familiar with that activity, but also people in those places get familiar with us. And then finally is, is general convention. General convention, <clears throat> As, 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 as you know, is, uh, is, is a representative uh, body and, but, and it's represented by all, the, and by all the diocese in the church and every diocese in the church gets to elect uh, four lay people, four lay deputies and four clergy deputies to convention. And those elections for those deputies are held at your diocesan convention. So, there is no reason why you shouldn't run to be a deputy to convention. And because, let me tell you something, there is no losing in a democracy. Run, lose, run next okay. time, and you might win, or you might get, become an alternative. Alternate. We, most di dioceses are allowed uh, to also send alternates who could sit in for their uh, duly elected deputies if anything happens. Um, and then, and and um, and and anything happening could be that a deputy wants to take the day off, um, and so that I, that participation is really essential. So let me get then to the technical uh, uh, way that we get. Uh, just to add to what Karen said, uh, how we get resolutions before general convention. There are four kinds of resolutions that go before general convention. Is a set of resolutions that come from interim bodies. And so we have uh, uh, standing interim bodies, and then we have interim bodies that are uh, uh, chosen uh, for perhaps for maybe three years or six years by uh, general convention. And those interim bodies can submit resolutions. All of those resolutions you are going to see soon in the so-called blue book. Which is, the, which is the publication of the reports of all of those interim bodies. And those resolutions get a letter in front of their number and they're called A resolutions. And then the bishops, any bishop can put a resolution uh, into general convention. Those are the B resolutions. Any three deputies, a deputy with two, with, 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 with two other deputies can submit a resolution to general convention. Any elected deputy to general convention can submit resolutions. And then there are the resolutions that come from dioceses as a whole themselves. So a diocese can uh, decide uh, to submit a resolution to general convention. They don't need anybody else to sign it because it's a vote of that diocesan convention. Um, and then they can submit those resolutions. Let me give you an example. So many times uh, uh, deputies in different parts of the country will have an idea that they want to propose to general convention, but they want it to come in with a little oomph. So it's not just coming from one bishop or, or three deputies, right? They want, it to sh they want to show that a whole diocese is in favor of that. Um, some of you know that a number of us want to get Barbara Harris on the calendar, right? And so we are uh, uh, encouraging dioceses to send in the resolution to put Barbara on the calendar. And so we hope to be able to cut the convention and there'll be 12 and there'll be 12 
and there'll be separate resolutions all saying the same thing, asking for Barbara to be on the calendar to show that there is this kind of ground, uh, uh, grassroots uh, support for this idea. Very good, very good. You might want to add that like everything else, um, only a privileged few can go to the general convention. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it's, and, and it's, basically, but basically because it, it used to be, I think, twelve days. Now it's uh, nine days. So oh, but, oh, you're like, you're talking you're talking about you're talking about just the class piece of our democracy. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so, so yeah. you know, it has to be yes. people who are able to leave work, leave family, you know, uh, whatever to go spend that amount of time someplace away from home. So that rules out a whole lot of people, right? So it really is important that you know who your general convention deputy is and that they are, will represent you at general convention if you can't go. I mean, I, I think that's a very important thing that, that uh, we realize that that's the way it works. And exactly. Now, most, most dioceses, <laughs> right, most dioceses will pay your way, pay your room and board. Right. Um, but the point, but as you say, quasi, which is a real thing, you are still taking off work. Right. You essentially have to use if you're if 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 clergy get away with this, see, you know, they, yeah. they, <laughs> but lay people really are, most lay people are taking vacation time when they go to general convention and or parents. Parents got to and exactly kids, yes right? yeah so I mean right. that, that's that's a real it, I, there's no way of resolving that but that is a reality and the only thing I'm, I'm saying to that is that know who your deputation is and if you want something to be put forth make sure that they're going to represent you as you do with with Congress and the Senate you know then you get people in office who represent your thinking. And I think that's where the UBE is really important, is that, you know, the issues that we will lift up that are important to people of color, we need to make sure that we have deputies that are going to represent that thinking as they go to general convention. And I think, and Kwasi is right also about the fact that, you know, the, the changes in structure, of course, general convention can make. Um, uh, all the women know that, uh, that, that the resolution that was passed that uh, allowed for women's ordination was passed in, in a September. So that meant that not only um, was it gonna be difficult just to be there as a deputy, but that meant that most teachers could not run for deputy because we used to have our conventions in the fall. And it was, and it was those people who objected to that and got us to move convention to the summer, right? And, and conventions moved to the summer happened in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add a couple of things. Um, Byron, I'm not sure that you mentioned that people can also be visitors to general convention. Oh, yes. Um, and so you don't need to be there for the entire nine days. Um, you know, you can come for a long weekend uh, there is a gallery. You can sit and see how the proceedings are going. You can sit in hearings so that there is an education for anyone who attends, even if they're not a deputy. Uh, there was a question in the chat about a deputy versus a delegate. Um, so the delegates to general convention are representing their congregations. Deputies to, sorry, Sorry, did I say delegates? Delegates to, delegates to, to, delegates diocesan. to diocesan conventions are representing right. their congregations, and deputies vote their conscience when they go to general convention. So, no, no bishop, no clergy, no layperson can tell you how to vote on a particular resolution. So, it's very important to know the mind of your delegate, your deputy. Sorry that you're voting to send to general convention. That's right, and, and you should, most dioceses will have, an op, have a time when people, uh, when, when the deputies talk to uh, anyone who wants to uh, hear, they'll have programs where you can come and listen and question 
um, your deputies and listen to your deputies' uh, plans and, and vision uh, for the upcoming general convention. Great. Thank you very much for that um, very expanded explanation. I might also add that um, there is a position paper on the UBE website entitled How to Submit Resolutions on Your Local on your local Dyson convention for adoption or endorsement at general convention. Robbie, would you put the um, link in the chat box for folks? Um, that is a how, how to um, position paper on how to um, get uh, local um, resolutions submitted and, su and sent down to general convention. And I might also add that on the UBE website, um, or, there are 17 resolutions that are being proposed by uh, the black deputies. And um, those are suggested resolutions that can be um, presented at your local dice and uh, conventions. Um, so take a look at those. Uh, and those are also on the uh, UBE, UBE website and the, they're easy, easy to find. Okay. Uh, our next question for each of the panelists, given the current state of our national racial polarization, as evidenced by the wave of voter suppression laws, the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color, for example, is it even worth my time trying to influence church, church policy? More to the point, what are the implications on my day-to-day -day life on the passage of a resolution at the local level that then becomes a general convention resolution on any of these matters? Let me take a stab at that if you don't mind. It is I think we're having this discussion because we want UBE to be relevant in today's world, <laughs> bottom line, right? And if, and if we're not relevant to what's happening in our day-to-day -day life as it impacts our community, especially communities of color, then the church becomes irrelevant, especially to young people. Now we know that most of our churches are 65 and plus if not older, part of that is because young people don't see the church as being relevant to their lives, to what impacts their lives. So it is important for us to be engaged in dealing with the issues that impact people's day-to-day -day lives. And the, the, the people see the church thinking those things are worth and are of value. So suppression of voting rights, the church should be engaged in making sure that people are registered. It should make sure that people understand the registration process, should make sure that people know when things are changing that impact their ability to vote. And the church should be engaged in those kind of educational programs and, and help people fight the, the recent laws that are coming across the country as a result of 2013 and the Supreme Court's resolution that, that free states up to do whatever the hell they want to do, that we are engaged in dealing with those issues and voter representation is one of the key areas where we impact those things which mostly impact our community. Like Byron was saying around COVID re uh, regulations, we got a crazy person down here in Florida as governor, right? We got to get rid of him. The only way to, to impact change so that all of our, and mostly black people and people of color who are dying from COVID because this stupid governor down here won't tell people to have to wear a mask, right? And then putting children at risk. If we're not engaged in those kind of issues as a church, then our church is not relevant. I tell the people on Sunday morning, if you come to church and you, and you come and you sing and you pray and you take communion, and then you leave and you don't do anything else during the week, you're not being a Christian. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're waiting to go to heaven, but you're not doing anything that what Jesus is really directing us to do, and that is to be in, involved and engaged in life. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, Quasi, that uh, we are a part of a predominantly white denomination. And I think it's important for us to use that. So we want, if we are able to get the majority of those white people to take positions that are progressive, that are anti-racism, racist, um, then what we're doing is influencing a piece of the white people who have 
literally more power than we do. Right. Mm. And so and that's part of our work as as if, if we have ch we have chosen this, we can be someplace else. We can all be AMEs and AMEZs. Right. Uh, we can all be black Baptist when, you know, in a minute. Um, and so we have chosen this particular role, this particular ministry of influencing white people in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And then and so then we are able to use all of those resources, not only of UBE, but of the whole Episcopal Church in seeking these kinds of important, important social changes in this country and the other countries in which the Episcopal Church is. An example of that, of course, is we have an office in Washington, D.C. So we have the Office of Government Relations. We have a staff that the Episcopal Church pays for, an office that they have in Washington to what they call advocate, what you and I will all call lobbying. And that's their job. And so what goes on that list of what they are working for is made up by general convention. So when we go to general convention and say we want the Episcopal Church to take a stronger position on voting and the right to vote for everybody in the United States and get that passed, then that staff is going to be working on that all through the three years before between conventions. Uh, some of the ways... I'm sorry, Kwasi, um, that we need to engage at our local level are not, as Kwasi said, it's not just about coming to church and praying and then going home. We need to be involved in community organizations, our school boards, our community boards, um, be in contact with our local representatives, um, to Congress, to, you know, um, your city council, even your police precinct. They are in uh, organizations that can connect us with resources in our community so that we can educate our people. Um, we also have some programs at, that are church-wide. Um, I remember going to Rooted in Jesus 2020 and getting all of this information about helping me, a toolkit that helped me engage my congregation to register to vote. Um, we, we're getting resources on how to engage our congregations with information to get vaccinated against COVID-19. The resources are available to us. We need to tap into it. And I'm not saying that just the priest needs to do that or the vestry. People in the pews, um, we are in a situation of shared leadership. And we can all take a piece of this in order to help us to move forward as a community. One of the examples of the power of the General Convention was in 1960, the creation of the Committee on Social Responsible Investments. You know, our pension fund has billions of dollars, right, that they collect. And now with this committee, they are charged with only investing socially in socially responsible companies. And that has a big impact on where our money goes, so we don't invest in tobacco. We don't invest in guns. We don't invest in a lot of things that are destructive community to the community. But that is a result of an action that took place at General Convention in 1960. So there's some powerful impacts in terms of influence that can take place as a result of resolutions that come out from the ground level. Great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to add that um, President um, Gay Jennings um, recently announced that there are 232 deputies of color uh, for the um, upcoming general convention. And that is a sizable um, um, vote, voting block uh, in terms of being able to influence um, resolutions that are passed and uh, in terms of the elections uh, for the next um, pres president of the House of uh, Deputies and the other various um, elections that will take place at General, at general Convention. Um, the point here that I'm trying to make is that it is, it is vital that we uh, engage at the local level 
Um, for example, the, uh, as, uh, ha as has been discussed earlier, the um, issue concerning voter suppression is critically important to our, to our survival as a democracy. And the, the number of people of color that paid in blood with their lives uh, for us to, for the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and some 50 years later, we're fighting that same issue. That is a, 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 a vital issue that we must uh, address. And um, I encourage you to, again, check out the UBE website and um, there is a voter suppression resolution um, in the, uh, among the 17 resolutions and um, um, try to get that resolution passed at, at your local diocese convention. And there's also another resolution involving uh, addressing the issue of the disparate impact of, of health, uh, uh, of, of, of the um, COVID um, pandemic, the, uh, the, in, the disproportionate impact that is, that is had on people of color, um, that, that calls for a study as to why, um, well, we all know why um, it's uh, had a disproportionate impact upon people of color, but uh, that, is a, that is crucial um, that we uh, look into that matter and address it so that we don't have a repeat of this going forward with the next pandemic. Okay, uh, is there anything else that any of the uh, pr presenters would like to add? I would just like to add uh, just one 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 piece, and I think most people know this, um, but uh, 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 and that is uh, at general convention, we elect and uh, and approve the appointments of lots of different offices. But one of the things we elect are members of our executive council, and the executive council, as you know, is the body that um, makes these uh, decisions in between. General conventions and our uh, executive council uh, is elected two ways, but members directly from by general convention, and then of course members elected by your several provinces. Um, but and so many of these issues, like the issue around voter suppression, uh, if it doesn't get raised at general convention, can still get raised by executive council. Um, and, uh, and, and, and of course we have, because uh, there is concern about waiting for general convention around all the, around the state issues around voter suppression, uh, that there's probably going to be a, a, res a resolution uh, discussed at the next executive council meeting just about that. Uh, and the whole issue of trying to get dioceses, we know the dioceses that are in the states that are, are passing all of these voter suppression bills. And we're going to be asking those dioceses to get more involved uh, in, in their work with their state legislators, like state legislatures. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Let's see, um, are there any questions in the chat box? I see someone asked how many of us show up at general convention. <laughs> That's a good, great question. We have, as, so, so I, I can never remember how many dioceses we have, but so every diocese can send up to eight voting members, three, four lay uh, and four clergy. And then, if, and, and as Joe said at the beginning, the general convention is bicameral. So there's the House of Deputies, which is half clergy and half lay. And then there is the separate House of Bishops. Um, and so when you add all those people up together, uh, you are over 850 people. So over 850 people are there in legislative sessions every day. Um, and, but for the average general convention, um, if you add up all the days and all the visitors and everybody just comes by for part of it, or everybody, all the people who do things like uh, man all the uh, exhibit 
booths and things like that, the usual, the average general convention has about 10,000 10, people come through it. Um, and so uh, it, it, is a, it is a big event. And for a lot of people, it is a huge, it's a reunion for all kinds of things. So most seminaries have dinners and stuff like that. Um, so if, again, to get uh, back to the point of, of visiting general convention, even if you're not uh, a deputy or a bishop, um, that you, there'll be lots and lots of things uh, that will engage you uh, at, 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 at general convention. And then, uh, for, and then of course, there is the worship, um, which we, we uh, uh, should mention. Um, and for the average Episcopalian, um, the average Episcopalian doesn't go to church with uh, uh, over uh, 500 people, right? Never goes to church on over 500 people unless a bishop is getting consecrated. And so it's, it's, it is not very often that the average Episcopalian sees uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people worshiping every day. And that happens at General Convention. We have a, a, a convention-wide worship every day that we're there, and and that part is not only fun, but is 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 spiritually reinvigorating. Um, Joe, I, I just if I can hop in for just a second, I want to do a plug here because we're talking <laughs> about UBE and we're talking about General Convention, and I think it's important to articulate as well as publish the fact <laughs> that our next annual meeting for Union of Black Episcopalians will be immediately preceding. General Convention. And we did that with intentionality so that we start on the 4th, we end on the 6th, General Convention opens on the 7th of July. And that will provide anybody who wants to just extend their stay by a day or more to buy one of those visitor tickets and go and spend some time in General Convention. You will have the best rates in the city because you will have gotten your room as part of the general convention blocks and it's holiday weekend. So this is the ideal opportunity for folks to go to the UBE meeting and then take that extra day and go over and see what general convention is about. Um, so I encourage you, more information is coming out in the email and check the UBE website, but I do encourage us not only to get involved by going to general convention, at least know what it looks like, what happens there. Um, I think you're gonna be captivated and compelled to get more deeply involved once you do that once. Right, thank you. Sir, ma'am, there's, there's a question in the chat. How can white people get out of their silos and stop the spiritual window dressing? And you, did you say white people? That's what the question was. Well, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I, some of you have heard me say this, um, uh, and I, I, I think I, I can more. The more and more I think about us in this denomination, the more and more I think we need to make a commitment that uh, we, we have to be missionaries, and we have to be missionaries to white people. I think the UBE, all black people in the Episcopal Church, have to figure out a way to be to see white people as their primary mission field because if because there's no other justification for being here there really isn't there is no other justification for us to to to, to with the opportunity that we have with having um, being in churches that are predominantly white be knowing so many white people um, for in, in all different ways in the Episcopal Church that we do not see as our primary, our primary source to make, to bring them to an understanding of baptism that includes everybody. And, and so it'd be nice to have a group, it'd be nice to have a, a group of white people, white Christians who see as their primary ministry, right? Uh, the, the, the recognition of every human being as a child of God, for real. Uh, where could ordinary Episcopalians find information about specific uh, subjects that impact parishes? Well, first from UBE. Right. And, uh, but there, there was a good deal of information around, uh, places around 
where where uh, this this information exists. But I would start with uh, UBE's uh, uh, material on the web, and then and if you don't find it there. Uh, you know, send the officers email. Byron, you know, when, my, when I decided to become a priest in 1969, seemed like ages ago, um, my, my brother said, well, why don't you go into the AME and the AME Zion, you know, because that was like the black power time and stuff like that. And I said, because I've grown up in the Episcopal Church, I know where the money is, I know where the power is, <laughs> why should I go to some other denomination where I'll be a neophyte, right? And that's true, just what you're saying. We need to use our position to influence those who make the decisions. And, and that's not only in terms of the church, but in terms of society also. We, in the Episcopal Church, we're fortunate, I guess, to have association with people who are in positions of power and authority. And because we have that connectedness of being Episcopalians, then we have a way a door open to having those conversations. And so we need to take advantage of that. You know, what Paul says, we're not called to be timid about this. Mm. We're called to I, I, use our power in terms of dealing with change in community. As a, a parish priest, um, my best resource are the people in the pews and the folks in the community around the church. Um, deep listening. Um, gets me connected with what is going on in the world around where um, action is needed. So I think that's also a resource for us. I think I, I really think that 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 really is essential. And I and and, you know, I you know, we we most most historic black churches began in black neighborhoods where most of the black people in those neighborhoods walk to their church, mm -hmm. right? And, we've, and, and there are very, very few of those churches anymore. And so we have to figure out what is the responsibility of churches, rema buildings remaining in the black community that are now commuter churches. And we, have, and we have to be, we have to see that the community around us, no matter what language they speak, right? is cannot be cannot be abandoned because the origin the the originators of our church don't live there anymore but now the reality is that many of the churches like detroit for example most of the black churches in the city are closed i think right. there's only one strong black episcopal church in the city of detroit now dc is another example and it's all across the area so not only are there no longer neighborhood churches? Not any no they, longer churches, at all. Churches, period. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, wrap up the question uh, period by asking each of the panelists for a one-minute um, comment on any topic that we've discussed here today. Well, if there's anybody, if there's anybody, I, I, I glanced at the, the list of participants and you, and, and I, I see many very active involved Episcopalians on that list. But if there's anybody here who has not run for any office in the Episcopal Church, run. That's my, run. And, and, I, and I, I would echo that. And I would say the UBE is to have life we need to be engaged in the life of the community. Um, I would say not just uh, the community, but to be also engaged in mission and ministry in your parish um, at the diocesan level, and if you're able at the church-wide level. Um, we need dedicated, competent, committed people at every level of our being, of our, our life. And, um, you know, again, our baptismal vow to seek and serve Christ in all persons, respecting the dignity of every human being. Wonderful. Thank you very much for all that very great, insightful and enlightening information. Mother Kim, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. 
Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you to each one of our panelists. Extraordinary. Thank you for stirring the pot or troubling the water, as uh, Kane Hope Felder might say. Thank you for doing that for us, that we may be motivated and compelled to act um, and to take on our, our place in the Jesus movement, which could very well be, thank you, Byron, uh, being missioners uh, to people of lighter hue. So I thank you so much uh, for your, your words today. We have many uh, wonderful, as has already been indicated, active uh, Episcopalians um, of a darker hue that are part of our panel and our presentation today. We thank each and every one, especially those who've been uh, and are current officers or past officers of uh, this uh, union of Black Episcopalians. And in having done that without um, uh, being explicit in exactly who those people are, you know who you are, we thank you for your um, devotion and your dedication to union and being with us today on this um, presentation. Our next session of Talk to Talk is that third Sunday in October. And we certainly look forward to everyone coming in being part of that occasion. And then in November, we will be sharing with you our first offering, full offering of We're Talking Now which is UBE's new quarterly author series for um, authors, editors, publishers of color uh, to introduce their materials and get us engaged in the work of uh, continuing to grow in, in knowledge and understanding. So we thank you very much. We end with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let Gracious, us pray. Let us to you. Gracious God, we love you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to tap into the experience and wisdom of leaders in your church. Now, having received what we have received this day, we pray that you give us the, the will, the determination to translate and transform all that we've received into action, action that builds up your church, action that breaks down walls and barriers, action that transforms us so that we can all be one on equal basis with equal representation and participation across the Episcopal Church and beyond. All this we pray in the precious name of your son, our savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you again, everyone. God bless you. You'll be able to get the recording on the UBE website uh, not too long in the near future. Please sign up to follow that uh, YouTube channel so that you can know when it is posted. God bless you. And we will be ending our time together at this time and look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Bye. Thanks for everything. Thanks.